is the healing of the man with the withered hand. Mark 3, 1 through 6. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. That, that was the Pharisees, the religious leaders. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to all of them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? to save life or to kill. But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately and conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy Jesus. Then in the second chapter of John, we also encounter something which made Jesus angry. <clears throat> Beginning with verse 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, Jesus drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign for your house? Then the Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, The temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for all the people. Amen. God's grace and peace be with us now. And may the words of my lips and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in the sight of our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have more scriptures than normal for our reading today. And our scriptures have taken me to another scripture, another passage in scripture. It's from this, the book of Genesis in the 28th chapter. When Jacob was fleeing, he had a dream. Jacob had, uh, and his brother had had a parting of the way. And Jacob had a dream using a rock for a pillow. And during the night, he dreamed of ascending and, and uh, descending angels on this ladder. When he awoke in the morning, which was in the place called Bethel, which becomes Bethlehem eventually, He's made a rather remarkable statement. He said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. It's the experience of realizing that in life, sometimes when we look back, or even at the moment, Sometimes we look back and we say, God was there and I didn't know it. God was present and I missed it. Or as someone wrote a book, said, uh, God came by and I was out to lunch. And uh, sometimes we get caught up in our busyness. Sometimes we get caught up in emotional turmoil. Sometimes we just 
get so busy, 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 busy that we don't sense God. Maybe you've had that experience, but let me share two or three experiences. One from a couple from real life and one from a play. The first one is when Helen Keller was looking back on her life in her autobiography. She reflected that, that the turning point for her life happened on March 3rd, 1887. Helen Keller at that time was age seven. When she was uh, about 18 or 19 months, you may recall, she had either meningitis or some other ailment that they never fully diagnosed. And she no longer was able to hear and she was no longer able to see. She was deaf and dumb. And her parents, you know, as she got through that illness, they cared for her, but they coddled her, and she became really an uncontrollable hellion or brat. And uh, she, uh, she described those days in her life as though she were a ship caught in a fog with no compass, no plumb line, just in lostness and filled with anger, frustration, and the in a sense of the enormity of the obstacles that she faced as a little child. And despair came visiting her, and it found a home within her. But on that day, March 3rd, she said, my life changed. Into her life came a young woman, Annie Sullivan, whose age, who also had visual impairment. And she writes in her autobiography about what it meant to have that fog lifted as a seven-year-old. The most important day I remember in all my life is the one in which my teacher, Annie Mansfield Solomon, came to me. I am filled with wonder when I consider the immeasurable contrast between the two lives which it connects. On the afternoon of that eventful day, I stood on the porch, dumb and expectant. I guessed vaguely from my mother's movement and signs and from the hurrying to and fro that something unusual was about to happen. So I went to the door and I waited on the steps. The afternoon sun had penetrated the mass of honeysuckle that covered the porch and fell on my upturned face. That maybe all of you have had that experience this week. <laughs> Me either. My fingers lingered almost unconsciously on the familiar leaves and blossoms which had just come forth. I did not know what the future held of marvel or surprise for me. Anger and bitterness had preyed upon me continually and left me with a great struggle. I felt approaching footsteps. I stretched out my hand as I supposed it to be my mother. But someone took it and I was caught up and held close in the arms of someone who had come to reveal all things to me. And more than all else, loved me. Now you may remember the story of the miracle worker in the movie, uh, the miracle worker as well. And, and you know that Annie Sullivan came and gave her a lot of love, but she also gave her very firm and at times violent discipline. She was not always loving. There was a little wild animal of a child and Annie's combination of very tender, warm, love and also the ability to be strict and disciplinarian, I guess we call it tough love, 
in, in today's language, her demand for obedience touched this girl deeply and made her into a human being in a very good way at that. Those hard days of loving and discipline imposed by Annie Sullivan were not easy to accept by this little girl, and she fought against them for a while, but it changed her. And I think I've felt that in terms of when life, uh, we run up against life, and there's, uh, we read the passage, uh, Mark did, the Ten Commandments for us this morning. And sometimes the Ten Commandments seem like uh, restricting things, you know, they just, uh, tie us up as though they're, they're there to uh, prevent us from being free. But the truth is, when we follow those Ten Commandments, we only have to worship one God. We don't have to worship a lot of idols, and they're all around. <coughs> we have to honor our mom and dad, that's wrong with that. We're exempt from killing. We're stealing. We're free from so many things if we follow those things. We don't have to covet things. It's really a release, a discipline of release. The very laws that God gives to us are, are, are uh, ways of finding freedom. And when we allow that to be part of our lives. Surely what we discover is that the Lord is in this place and we know it not. Hey, many times, but I, I, I will not say that I keep all the commandments perfectly. Probably screw up every day. Sometimes I might get 80 out of 10 right. <laughs> but when I follow them, Life is so much better, so much freer, so much fuller. It's when that is done, I realize that surely the Lord is in this place, and I know it not. And Helen Keller realizes when she runs into discipline, along with love, that surely the Lord was in this place, and I knew it not. Mark Twain, who tended to be cynical toward the end of his life because of so many terrible things that happened to him, said that Helen Keller was one of the two most interesting personalities in the 20th, in the 20th century. That, um, uh, or in the 1800s, the 19th century, I should say. Uh, that ever lived. He said the first one was Napoleon because he conquered the world in his quest for power. But Helen Keller conquered the world because she conquered her own physical limitations to become a beautiful and noble lady. A second example, and this one from movies or, or a play, I saw it in a movie. But it's the, the, the play, uh, The Elephant Man, or the movie. And it's the story of Joseph Carey Murray, who was horribly deformed at birth. Uh, I had uh, grotesquely out of shape. Uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It just hands terribly deformed his body, so that he was in he was put in a freak show, and uh, and in the play there's a time when a Mrs. Kendall, uh, who was a famous actress during his period of life, which was in the 1800s. 19th centuries. She came to see him. And uh, 
she almost, when she met him personally, she almost uh, turned away because he was, he looked so repulsive. But she didn't. And she ended up in a conversation with him. And they had got to talking about Romeo and Juliet. And she was struck by his understanding of the play and by his knowledge of it. When the conversation was finally ended and they were getting ready to part, she holds out her hand to shake his. He has one hand inside his jacket, which is horribly deformed. This one is uh, slightly deformed, not as bad. So he reaches out with the other hand, and I, and I can't remember which, which hand, you know, but he reaches with the other hand, and she doesn't take it. She just waits and waits and looks at it. And it's obvious that she's waiting for him to take this deformed hand out. And he finally does. And he reaches it out and she holds his hand and shakes his hand. And they part. That's at the end of the first act. And just before the curtain drops on that act, the elephant man remarks to no one in particular, but to the audience, that is the first time that I've ever held a woman's hand. And out of that encounter with her, much of his spiritual healing begins to take place. Uh, years ago, I, uh, I preached a sermon on the Elephant Man and portrayed him. And um, when they did it in theaters, some of them, they, they would not try to dress up the actor because there was no way to make it to the point of his position. What happened there for Joseph Carey Merrick was that her ac accepting him as a human person began his healing, his spiritual healing. And although he doesn't say it, surely the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. Jesus is in this temple the synagogue, and when he goes in, everybody has their eyes on him. And it says, they were looking to see what he would do. You, you, you ever run into some people who, I just wonder if the kids are going to misbehave today. I just wonder if, you know, what the more kids are going to do. And they kind of have that I can't, yeah, I just want to know, you know, what's that athletic trainer going to have us do today, you know? And, and, uh, and so they're there, and they look, and Jesus goes in, he sees the man who has a withered hand. And he looks around, and he can sense what's in the minds of the Pharisees. So he says, is it the competitive be good or bad? To heal or not on the side. And of course, they can't answer that question. Because if they say to heal, he can go ahead and heal. And then they run in with the law. And, and, and if they're, you know, and they say no, what are the people going to say? So they keep their mouth shut. And Jesus, in anger, says, stretch out your hand to the man. And he stretches it out and he heals it. And at that point it says that the Pharisees went out and began to conspire with the Herodians, which is the court of the Roman Empire.
came here. And so at that point, they, they something, people they never would have talked to, and they conspired for his death. Surely the Lord is in this place, and they know it not. Because of their prejudice and looking, they couldn't see that Jesus was doing good. Now, the third example is in a hospital setting, or a nursing home setting, similar, uh, perhaps with where you were this week, a uh, uh, nursing home in the hospital. And it was uh, a visitor who would come in to see someone, and I happened to be there. And I knew they were quite, they were a busy person. But they conferred very nicely with the patient, the one that I had come to see. And then as they left, uh, and, and it was obvious they did not know another individual who was sitting out in the court. But I saw them stop and pull over a chair and sit down and have a brief conversation with the person. And then smiling, getting up, shaking their hand, and then tapping them on the head, kind of like, see you later, or, or whatever they said. And I thought, what a beautiful moment. When this uh, unexpected encounter of someone reaching out and being gentle and, and sensitive to another person. I can't read too much into that situation, but what I sensed was that that made a wonderful difference if only for a few minutes for that person in that chair who had had so many people walk by him through the day. For someone to encounter them and to suddenly say, uh, uh, you're worth something. Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not when I saw that. God comes again and again and again, and sometimes God touches us violently, like with the Ten Commandments, saying, you know, come on, shape up so that you can, uh, uh, like any Sullivan had to shape up. Or Andy Sullivan shaped up, Helen Keller, I should say. God comes when we are wondering what we are to do and if we can ever make it. And God comes empowering us with someone into our lives who says, yes, you can, you can do it. I don't think of, uh, uh, you know, and I, I've already picked on you once, but I'm going to do it again. But I think uh, athletic trainers, I, I remember at, uh, when I was at Michigan State, I was in any of the athletic programs, but I went through the program of health education, da da da, and uh, uh, not, not to the level that you are by any chance. But um, I thought about how, how some of the trainers worked with the ones, and it was, you know, it's kind of tough love at times. You, you need to do this if you want to recover, if you're going to play basketball or whatever it is. and. Uh, and in the obedience, we find that God as, as, uh, is present as we've never found God before when, when we're able to take that tough love. God comes like Mrs. Kendall in the play, looks at our deformities, which we try to hide. Uh, we, you know, we don't want anybody to know what my deformities are. Uh, you know, we, we don't want them to know our addictions, our habits, our, our bad things. It's bad enough to be married to somebody that knows us real well, you know, but you know, they have to, 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 to share that with other people. And when we try to come before God, we do the same thing. We stick our arm <coughs> under our coat. We don't want God to see the bad part of us. And the freedom comes when, we're, when God just sits. God stands there in a way as a patient lady or as a patient man. And God just says, uh, I'm just going to wait. Until you take your hand out, Carol, and show me all of who you are. And God does the amazing thing. God says, I still love you. 
And when we do that, for the first times in our life, for some of us, we know what it means to be touched by God and to encounter the grace of God. God comes to us again and again and again. But are we open? Jesus is angry because the temple had been made a place of thieves and not a house of prayer. The Pharisees missed seeing God because they were locked in to see what they wanted to see. I wonder how often I miss God because I'm looking only for what Carol wants to see. There's an old story, maybe you've heard it, of a young man who had, uh, with his wife, of, uh, relatively a few months at that time, and she decided she would cook a roast. So she got out her knife and she cut the roast right in two, half and half. Then she got out two pans and she put half a roast in one pan, half a roast in the other pan, puts it in the oven and cooks it. Why'd she do that? It seems kind of, it doesn't make sense. So he says to her, why do you do that? He says, she says, that's the way I've always cooked the roast. Well, but he said, why? why? Why do you cut it in two? She says, I don't know. My mother always did. So he goes to the phone. He calls up his mother-in-law. And he says, uh, I don't know. Any Rebecca? No. <laughs> I'm going to say, it's her. Rebecca is cooking the roast here today. And what Rebecca did was she... Uh, so you cut the roast in two and put it in two different plants. Is, is that what you do? Oh, yes. She said, yes, that's, what, that's how I cook it. And he said, well, why do you do it? She said, because my, my mother did it. So then they finally, he, he, a little bit later, the, Rebecca and him, uh, they, they see the grandmother. So he says, I have a question for you. And it, regarding the roast. And he said, why did you do that? And she said, oh, I did that uh, way back because I didn't have a pan big enough for the whole roast. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, God gives us a big enough roasting pan. <laughs> big enough to sense God's presence in wherever we are. If we let our mind be open. If we let our heart be filled with prayer. And if we look at life through the eyes of Jesus. Maybe share that offer.